Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. Today we have got episode number 60. Episode 60 is crazy that we've done 60 episodes already. Uh, but we will be talking all things game one of the NBA Finals. We are not going to delay. You know the drill. Housekeeping, as always. Like, comment, subscribe to the channel. If you're on the audio platforms, go ahead and leave us a five-star rating. Leave a review. It's much appreciated. Follow us at the socials, um, at Off The Glass Pod on Instagram and at Off The Glass Podcast on TikTok. Dane, bro, how are we feeling one game deep into the NBA Finals? I'm doing good, man. I'm excited. Honestly, bro. Well, it don't matter what would have happened. I'd have been excited, or, or, like, because it did end up like technically being a blowout. I was excited regardless. I just wanted to see a basketball game. Like, I literally didn't care. So <laughs> it, it had ex- been a little minute. It had been a little minute. It, it had been a hot little minute. So I'm excited. Um, I'm ready to get into you know the recap of game one, and then I guess our predictions of what we think is gonna happen for the next game. So I'm excited for sure. And y'all are, are probably watching <laughs> or listening to this Saturday night. Or Sunday before game two, trying to get this out um, on Saturday night so that we can keep it as relevant as possible. Because after game two, a lot of this analysis is going to go right out the window and everything's literally all lives are going to shift to Dallas for game three. Um, no, we've been doing quotes of the week to start off the episode. I'm pushing that, pushing that to the back because because we got to jump right into this with game one. Um, obviously, Celtics take down the Dallas Mavericks 107 to 89. It was not a close game really at any point. The Dallas or Dallas did go on it was like a 25 to three or 25 to eight, something like that run mm-hmm. in the second or third quarter after being down by more than 25 points. It was almost down by 30. Uh, I think at one point in the first half, uh, they cut the lead to, I believe it was nine eight. or eight points. Yeah. got it down to single digits. And then the Celtics immediately came back with a run of their own. And they, they kept the game out of reach for Dallas in its entirety. So um, some of y'all may have seen I put up an instant recap video. I'm going to be doing that after every single game, literally like 15 minutes after the game ends. So I've had a lot more time to sit and digest, you know, what we saw in game one on the court. Um, there's some more stuff that's been going on off the court that we'll get into as well. Uh, but want to get your initial reactions just top to bottom. What did you think about the Celtics performance in this one? Um, and then obviously the Mavericks lackluster performance as well. Um, honestly, you know, I'm not too surprised of what I've seen, especially from the Celtics. I mean, I even said it in my prediction, even when I even though I still picked them up, I said the Celtics should win this series. And the main reason why I'm not surprised is because the way the Celtics play in their lineup gives Dallas problems as far as how can I put this in this this whole series is really gonna be a battle of play styles and who's going to be able to play whatever way they want to more often mm-hmm. because Boston wants to spread you out five out um, shoot threes, drive, kick, move the ball, those type of things. And on defense, they're able to have the facilities to switch pretty much a lot, like almost everything. They have guys who can guard a lot of different positions. So they really, they really played their style of basketball. And when it's working, it looks like amazing and it looks unbeatable. Like when they're hitting shots, when they're moving the ball, when they're locking in on defense, it looks like a very, very hard team to beat, which because they are. Um, so I'm really not surprised that they were able to play their type of basketball. Um, I guess some takeaways from it is I like the way they they kind of made it like like you even you literally have it as one of the titles. Luca held to one assist, right? Like all the guys didn't get it going. Like they kind of prevented the Mavericks from playing their style of basketball. I don't think they had any lob attempt let alone a lob dunk finish um like i said luca has one assist so he wasn't really getting teammates involved that much um and yeah they were just playing great they were playing great on both sides of the ball um we had tingus pingus out here hooping <laughs> <laughs> tingus pingus was going crazy he came out i thought he was gonna be at least a little rusty he said nah no. like with a jack in it from Crazy deep bro, off the he kick. Was, he was pulling from deep. I'm like, bro, what is this? Like, I know he got that. I, I know he got it in him, but damn. Um, abusing the mismatch, shooting right over him, that little mid-range jumper. That's kind of his little thing. Had it going, and then like you said, pulling the deep threes, um, playing great defense as well. The rim protection obviously was there. Huge. Um Jalen Brown, Jalen Brown played great, especially on both sides of the ball. He he was guarding Luka, playing rim perimeter defense, kind of picked his pocket twice, but also was still rim protecting. Like he just played an all around. Three steals game. and three blocks, and um, they weren't like chase down blocks. Brown. They were they were like I'm the big man side rotations. Yeah. yeah. 
So he played great. I just th- I think they had an overall good uh good performance from all, their whole team. Their whole team felt like there was one one um one very close knit unit. Um and just played great. They played their style of basketball. That's the biggest thing. They made the Mavs kind of go away from what they do best, and then they played their brand of basketball. So I'm not really surprised about the outcome. Surprised about the outcome because when they play their style of basketball and their hidden threes, it's gonna be a really hard thing to stop. Definitely. Uh that one assist for Luca. Uh, that's the lowest for him since his rookie year. Um, and then for the Mavs as a whole, they only had nine assists this game as a team. Um, mm-hmm. For context, the lowest total that they had in their previous series against Minnesota was 19. And that was in game five where you had Kyrie and Luka just putting whoever was on them in isolation and getting bucket after bucket. And even with that, still managed to get 19 assists out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, So it really goes to show you to your point that the Celtics were able to take away a lot of what had been working for Dallas this entire playoff run. Two biggest things. One of them you mentioned, obviously, being um, those lobs. A lot of that had to do with a guy who whose game one performance is getting, I think, unfairly criticized, um, which is Jason Tatum, because Mm -hmm. on the defensive side of the ball, he was matched up on that lob threat big on most of those. Um, occasions and did a great job of neutralizing um, what would be a lot of those those easy buckets um, for the Mavericks what things that get other guys going and then you've seen teams in the past try to overcorrect to them and it turns into kick out threes and you know he just did a great job of not only guarding uh, Gafford or Lively whichever one was in the game at that point at the rim but also was a great I don't know why my watch talk out of nowhere Mm -hmm. um but he did a great job as well of cl- crashing the glass. I think he had 11 total rebounds. Nine of them were on the defensive side of the ball. Um, so tall task for a, you know, wing, obviously a big wing, but to be banging down there with a seven-footer, um, be able to secure a lot of defensive rebound and possessions for Boston, as well as his playmaking, I think, was was huge um, for Boston in this one. Obviously, he only finishes up with five assists, but he definitely could have had a ton more. He had a lot of you know, hockey assists to say it's not necessarily even ones that, you know, it was a pass to a pass that scored, but just the times where he drives and kicks um, to start that rotation for um, the Mavericks defense that turns into someone finding an open three or an open shot down the line. Um, I think I saw a stat that he was over 60% um, on kickouts on his drive attempts in this game. And I think his regular season, season average was somewhere around 25%. Um, so very clear and evident that he was quickly recognizing the bodies that were being packed in the paint every time he was getting two feet in the paint, kicking out to open man, and that was leading to, to a ton of threes. I think they were over 40% from three in the first half. They finished up around 38% um, for the whole entirety of the game, but, they, again, they kind of just took their foot off the gas a little bit um, in the third quarter, and at the same time, that's what happens, and if there are little silver linings here for Dallas, that's a part of it. And that's one that's something that we've talked about like a crutch or a crux, excuse me, of the Celtics for a while is when you play the way that they do with so many threes, you're bound to go cold for stretches of at a time. Sometimes a full game, you just are not, mm-hmm. not going to fall. Um, so you know that that is that's going to happen at some point in this series. Like you have to anticipate that. On the flip side, though, I will say I was very, very impressed. And you already mentioned Jalen Brown, all that he did on the defensive side of the ball, while also being the leading scorer for the Celtics. He was super aggressive in this one at not settling for perimeter jump shots, but getting downhill, getting to the nice. rim. Um, he ended up with 11 free throw attempts in this game. Um, and again, a lot of that just had to do with the fact that he was just not content with taking a well, it was probably a very makeable and good shot for him, but getting down, getting into Lively's chest, got Lively in foul trouble super early. I think he gave him like <laughs> three or four fouls in like a three-minute stretch um, mm-hmm. in the third quarter. Um, so, so yeah, super, super impressed with mm-hmm. um, Jalen Brown's performance. Some would say the best player on the Celtics. Some would some say. Some would say. Some would <laughs> say. And, let, let, you know, let's, let's get into that. For those of y'all that don't know, um, obviously, I think at, every day during the finals, um, teams have media availability and they do press conferences. And so Jason Kidd had his earlier today. And he made a comment that said um, that he believes that, you know, Jalen Brown is the best player 
on the Celtics. Um, that was before the Celtics players had their media availability. So obviously they all were getting asked it. Jalen Brown said he really doesn't care. Jason Tatum said that, um, you know, and this is not word for word and paraphrasing, but he said that, you know, obviously Jalen is a great player. Um, it's more of a testament to, you know, all the work and stuff that he's done for him to be kind of mentioned in that way. But he understands that he feels like Jason Kidd is trying to, trying to, you know, divide them, drive a little wedge in there, <laughs> you know, plant a little seed in their brain. Because, um, and I'm going to turn it over to you after this. I said that I thought that Jason Tatum played was not a phenomenal performance, but I thought he played a good basketball game because it goes back to what one of the biggest reasons why I picked the Celtics in this series, which is that they don't need the both of them to be Superman to win these games. And I think one of the biggest differences for this finals run and the last finals run with Boston, A, obviously they have better better team, better personnel as a whole. They did not have Drew Holiday and Chris Stapps and Derek White the last time they went to the finals. But Jason Tatum understands that his team and the supporting cast around him is so good, he just doesn't force anything. He just makes the right play every single time. I said his playmaking was huge, and there's no need for him to, and they are a better basketball team when they do. There will be a time where he's going to have to turn that on. He didn't have to in this game, and he didn't force the issue there. Um, so with that, how are you feeling about what Jason Kidd said? And do you agree with it to any any extent? Because there are there are like, and it's not even just Twitter stuff. Like we've reached like mainstream media people echoing the same segment that they think that Jalen Brown is the, the real number one on the, on the Celtics. So how, how are you feeling about that? Especially after game one. Uh, first, I just want to piggyback. I, I completely agree with what you said about Tatum when I feel like when I was watching Tatum a year ago, two years ago, he <clears throat> in games where he didn't have it going or like there was plenty of times I felt like when I watched the Celtics, I'm like, bro, Jalen Brown, like has it going. Tatum is still like, nah, like I have to be the guy. Like I'm still going to get my shots. I'm still going to force the issue. Now it's like, obviously, like you said, the team is better. Um, but I really do give credit to him for being more aware of that. And like, you know, really, I feel like if I say taking the back seat, people going to run with it. But realistically, like just knowing when he doesn't have to do too much and when he doesn't have to force the issue and knowing that, look, they don't need me. Like I said, need me to be Superman right now. I'm just going to play defense. I'm going to rebound. Obviously, I'm still going to get my shots up. I'm still, you know, Jason Tatum. But I'm not going to force it to the point where I'm hurting the team um, when we got guys like Przingis going off. We got Jalen Brown going off. So credit to him for that. Um, he definitely gets a lot of credit because before him, like I said, I definitely felt like he didn't really know when to ease up a little bit. Um, but <laughs> as far as the comments with Jason Kidd, I mean, yeah, you know, a lot of people's been saying that. A lot of people's been saying, you know, Jalen Brown's a better player. Jalen Brown has that dog in him that Jason Tatum doesn't have. He has a true alpha mentality. Um, and as far as just Jason Kidd saying it, I just think I think it's definitely mind games. I think I think he's definitely trying to <laughs> he's trying to force Tatum to be like, what? I'm I'm not the best player. I bet and shoot thirty five shots or something. Right. Like that. So yeah. he's he's definitely trying to bait him a little bit to say, look, I. I'm the best player. And then that honestly, that's going to help the mass more than anything. And Tatum comes out trying to be Superman when he doesn't have to. Because in reality, if he just plays the way he does um, and, all, and steps up when he's needed versus just trying to go out there and force the issue, they would be uh, at a better spot. Um, <laughs> so I think definitely think it's mind games from that aspect. Um, but yeah, it has reached past Jason Kidd. It's reached past because it definitely used to be just a Twitter take, like a little like Jason mm -hmm. Hayden, Jason, uh, Jason Tatum. Twitter hater take. Now it's like legit. Like, hold on. Like, people think Jalen Brown because he won the Eastern Conference Finals MVP. Uh, he had a better first game. He's honestly probably, eh, he's had a, good, a really good playoffs. Um, it's definitely reached that point. And honestly, to me, it's a little bit tough. Um, not the debate. I, I think Jalen Tam's a better basketball player. Um, I just think people see Jalen Brown playing a little bit better and instantly run with that. But in the same term, it's like, Jason Tatum is going to get more attention because he is the actual better player. Like he's going yep. to get the defensive attention for like as the first option. He's going to get the other team's best perimeter defender. Where Jalen Brown is going to get the second best perimeter defender. Um, he like I said, Jason Tatum kind of sets things up for everyone on the team because like he, I, like I said, he warrants a lot of attention in himself. 
Um, so it's really a credit to him to, like I said, not force the issue and allow those other guys to feed off of his uh, attention that he brings to himself. Um, so it's really a credit to him. But what comes with that is your numbers might be a little bit lower. You got a guy like Jalen Brown going off. Now the chatter is, oh, my God, Jalen Brown is a better player, blah, 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 blah. So in reality, I just think that Tatum's better. <laughs> I think he's the better player. Jalen Brown is playing great, though. You can, I think people need to realize you can talk up one player without diminishing another. Like Thank you can you. talk up Jalen Brown. If Jalen Brown wins finals MVP, Jalen Brown's a damn good basketball player. Right. Like, that doesn't mean Tatum sucks. <laughs> like if he doesn't win finals MVP, like they're just good. Like I think Steph, Steph won three rings, but he got one finals MVP. He Nobody didn't get, talk about Steph like that. If Steph lost a finals MVP to Iguodala. Like, right. come on, bro. Like, we, bro, we, dudes was leaving that series saying, is LeBron going to be the first player ever to win <laughs> right. finals MVP on a losing team? Fact, like, bro. It is – it's so – such a small set of games. And in in a playoff series, you're always getting the most ridiculous defensive schemes thrown at you. It's so, so hyper-focused and analyzed to be able to stop individual things that your top players like to do. And that's amplified even greater in the NBA Finals. It's, as the series goes on, you're going to see more and more little things that make it more and more difficult for these top guys to get their stuff off. And if one of the best counters to that for Jason Tatum is to just be an unselfish basketball player and put we before me and let the whole team eat, I, Jason Tatum's going to do that 10 times out of 10. He could care less about his counting stats and his box score if he wins a ring. He could play the by. Box score, you know, just looking at the how many points he puts up, he could play terribly to the people that just they don't only have 15 in this game. He's he getting carry, he getting carry. If they win a ring, he literally could care less, bro. And I just think that I don't understand the Tatum hate because it'd be different if people were saying, yo, Jason Tatum's the best player in the world. Then I'd be like, Oh, then people would probably pull these games and be like, all right, let's bring it down a notch. But it's like, no one's calling Tatum that. Like, I feel like Tatum is, like, properly ranked, like, right. in his, like, status in the league. So it's like, I don't, I just don't see the need to knock Tatum because it's like, for what? Like, no one's overrating him. So it's like, why bring him down? Like, I, I just, I don't get the need. I don't, I don't really see why people want to bring him down so much. Like, it's like the Tatum A is insane for a guy that, I, if even if you just look at it like game wise, like personality wise, it's not like a he doesn't give off a polarizing like player. Like he just seems like a regular NBA star. I don't see why there's like a right. need to like knock him bring him down to like this a lower level where he's not at. So I don't know. It's just interesting. But uh I don't know. People are bored. So I guess they just come up with you know storylines and narratives that fit their fit their fit their mind. But then again, it's like like I said before, if Dalen Brown wins finals MVP, like I don't see Tatum no less than what he is now really no. like it does it's not going to change my mind honestly if Tatum wins the finals MVP he's still going to stay at the same spot for me so it's not right. nothing is going to change if they win or if they lose like now if he comes out here and he plays like terrible like it's like he's scoring five points or something then okay cool right. but like bro he's had 16 points like you did what the team needed Jalen Brown stepped up presenting it's like that's the luxury of having a really good team you don't have to do too much yeah so I don't know it is what it is yeah, to, to wrap up the Jason Kidd comments, look, we know we know Jason Kidd is a he's a crafty coach. You know, he's he uses the he uses the noggin. All I know is if Tatum come out here and shoot 30 shots, <laughs> them <laughs> comments got to his head. Yeah. Uh we, we all remember when he uh told I don't even remember who it was at this point to purposely bump him so he could spill his uh, drink on the court yeah. so he could draw up a little play while yeah. wiping up the drink. So look. Hit me. He said, right. hit me. Clear as day. Hit me. <laughs> he even tried to hide it. <laughs> nah, he don't care. He was eating a fine regardless. Facts. Um, yeah, but look, we, we know he's a, a he was a crafty guy when he was playing. Mm. Um, crafty still as a head coach. So it's definitely mind games to try to drum up not even just a wedge between – well, yes, to drum up a wedge between – JT and Jalen Brown and just internally in that Celtics locker room. But he knows that this is what was going to happen, that people's going to hop on their podcast, that ESPN is going to pick it up. 
on social and it's just going to amplify it and make it even more and more louder. He's just Basically hoping that knows ball. He knows what he's talking about. So right. He, he just, he's just hoping that they're in the locker room and you know, they're watching sports center before the game. And Stephen A is talking about it on the pregame show. He just, again, he just trying to plant that little seed. Cause there's no. a human aspect to it too, of your Tatum. Like it's a, like I said, it, that's why I said he, it gets a lot of credit from me for not uh, forcing an issue a lot of times because it is, you're human, bro. Like if I feel like, let alone actually are, I actually am the best player on the team, and like you're talking about this guy, like the other team's like, yeah, you know, he's really the best player. Like some party, you sometimes you could be like, man, no, I, bro, let me really show him like I'm the best. Right. So it's like there's a human aspect to it. So Jason Kidd knows knows what he's doing, hundred um, percent. But you did say something that I I want to touch on, and I brought it up as soon as I posted that at first reaction after the game because I knew this is what the conversation was gonna be. I already knew people was going to get on Twitter. People was going to get on these these shows on ESPN or Fox Sports, whatever. And they were going to be like, here we go. What other team could their best best player should go, whatever he was, like six for 16 with 16 points, and they still blow the other team out? Again, like you said, it's a luxury of having such a good roster. But I said in my video, and it still stands true now, and the same thing that you mentioned, I really wish the conversation wasn't so focused on Tatum, 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 and we can't just appreciate, bro. Jalen Brown is a ridiculously complete basketball player. Like a lot of people come into the league and they they throw that that two-way label on a lot of these people, guys who can come in and immediately make that impact on defense. And it's like, if that jump shot can get there, if that self-creation can get there, you're looking the guy, the biggest name that gets thrown around is Kawhi, right? It's like you have a lockdown perimeter defender and then a guy who can be a closer, a guy who can create his own shots, can score all three levels. It's like that is the dream prototype wing. And it's like that's kind of what the mold that they wanted Jalen Brown to become. And he's one of the because that label gets tossed around a ton every single draft, including this year's draft. You're gonna see a lot of guys who are going to be in that that type of, of mold that they're going to try to throw on them. Jalen Brown, Kawhi Leonard, those are guys that they're going to try to get compared to, and a lot of them are not going to be able to live up to that hype. Case in point, guy like Patrick Williams in Chicago, obviously not fully writing him off because he's you know still young and has time to develop, develop, but it has not panned out to be this baby Kawhi that they thought he was going to be at first when he was drafted because it's hard to be that good at all aspects of basketball. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I that part of your game, right? And I wish that, like, that is what the conversation could be about. Because it's like, bro, this man had three steals and three blocks. He's ripping up a guy that people like. We do like not even like, us. I'm saying like the media and fans as a whole are starting. To, I've, I've seen the Luka Doncic best player in the NBA conversation really ramp up. Did he pass Jokic up? Like he ripped him up twice. He just was putting everybody in the West, like, ran through the, the tougher conference. Jalen Brown said, I don't care. Like, lockdown defense on him, tough shot making, aggressive to the rim, like, complete game at every single level. And that's just a testament to his development, his work ethic to get to that point. And I wish that's where the conversation was <clears throat> and not – is he better than Tatum? Is Tatum overrated superstars? Like, bro, why does it always have to be that? Why does it have to be that? It's and it's funny though because, and this is how you know, you everyone only likes negative stuff. Everyone, everyone always only likes negative stuff because just a while ago it was JB sucks. He can't go left. He can't go no left hand. He can't go left. Now all of a sudden it's like like you're not giving the same praise for be, like being a improved really yeah. good all around basketball player unless now he's it's down to his knock teammate. down exactly unless it's to knock down his teammate like it's like it's only like you only want negative stuff that's the thing mm-hmm. I, that's why I'd never listen to those conversations because those same people were just saying Jalen Brown can't go left so I'm not right. hearing now all of a sudden he's the best player in Tatum sucks because. Before it was JB stinks. He shouldn't be the highest. You're really gonna pay him three hundred million dollars, make him the highest paid player in the league. No. Now all of a sudden he looks like he's. Oh, if he was on a different team, he'd make it to the finals himself. Like if he had his own team. So now, like I don't get that. So yeah, people are gonna talk about negative stuff because the topic of the conversation is Tatum and his performance when it could be like said Jalen Brown, or it could be the conversation could be Yo, bro, 
Tatum only had 16 points, didn't really shoot that great from the field. It could go from, oh, he stinks, to, oh, Tatum only had 16 points, didn't shoot that great. Well, this Celtics team is really good. Like, they really got a really good roster. Like, this right. is a really good team. But, no, the topic is the bad. It's always going to be negative, which is – that's basketball discourse, I guess. Yeah, it's – I feel like it just continues to get worse the more and more prevalent that social media has become and the more the, – Easier that it has become to access an audience. Like we could definitely be, and there are a lot of podcasts out there who this is this is their bread and butter. This is the whole like every single episode. It like we would have a whole topic just on man, is Jason, is Jason Tatum really that washed? Is Jalen Brown the alpha on the Celtics? 40 Bro. minutes, 40 Bro. minutes on that. Bro, I tell you right now, if we wanted to be like that, I could have had our TikTok to like. <laughs> 50,000 following right. by now. We really wanted to just be like takey, like, bro, you, yeah, because that's what people love to see. People love the negative stuff, which is right. terrible. It's it's a time and place, and debating is always fair, but it's like when it feels like you are just doing it for the sake to have something to hate on, it just is not, it's not worth it, bro. And some people really watch basketball and sports in general through that lens, and it just can't be can't be enjoyable cannot be enjoyable um i do want to get back to some of the schematics in this game before we kind of look past it um into game two um another thing that i wanted to touch on and i think we we brought up in the preview was that obviously the the maverick shot the most corner threes um out of any team in the nba this past year and the celtics gave up the least amount of corner threes in the NBA this past year, we knew one of those things had to give. Um, and so far in game one, it has been this Celtics defense just being that good, making it difficult on guys like P.J. Washington to get um, those open looks in the corner to the point where they were letting him get open looks at the wing or the top of the key. They're not giving it up in the corner. where He has been so good um, this entire playoff run. He went 0 for 3 from 3. Kyrie has a game that honestly he cannot play like this in a game that they are going to win. Like the, mm -hmm. the, he doesn't have that luxury like guys on the Celtics do. He can't go six for 19, Oh, five from three to us. He has more turnovers and assists, like 12 points. They are not going to win a game in the series with a Kyrie Irving performance like that. He has to be better. And a lot of those shots were shots that are very makeable for him. He missed some wide open threes. He missed mm -hmm. some some uh, drives to the rim, some floaters that he was knocking down at will against you know Minnesota in the Timberwolves series. He um, up I don't. Foot, he traveled. He traveled. I was like, "What is going yeah, like, on? Did, did, who stole his powers? Because this is not <laughs> Kyrie Irving." <laughs> um, I don't want to say that the crowd got to him because he's played in Boston a bunch, obviously since his departure there. He knew it was coming. There's no shock level there anymore. Um, yeah, I don't expect him to play like this consistently. Um, I don't think that there was even a, a a ton that Dallas was doing in some of those instances to get those results. Like some of it really just felt self-inflicted for Kyrie. Um, the biggest problem that I saw for the Mavericks, um, if I have to pinpoint it to one thing specifically on the defensive side of the ball, they cannot, cannot switch as much as they were in game one. That's a big reason why Chris Stapps got off to the hot start that he did, because why is Josh Green on him at any point in time? Chris Stapps is seven foot three. Josh Green can't contest Chris Stapps. And Chris Stapps isn't a guy who's going to sit here and freaking back you down in the post like a, you know, a real, real traditional big. He's not going to hit you with no elbow drop step. You know, shack slam on the rim. Like, no, he's gonna face you up. He's gonna hit turnaround jumpers. He might just turn up and shoot over you. Like, mm -hmm. he's going to work out of the post in a much more finesse way. Work out of the mid range, and obviously, we know one of the best, if not the best, pick and pop big um, in the NBA right now. And all of that was on full display in in this game. And man, a lot of that had to do with the fact that the Celtics were way, way too willing to switch onto him and or not the Celtics, excuse me, the Mavericks. Yeah, yeah. And they, uh, I don't I think we mentioned at all at any point that 
this like the Mavericks are a team that's like that switchable, like one through five, because they're mm-hmm. not. No. They have <laughs> people that you can attack. We've given our credit to guys like Luca and Kyrie. Um, you know, this playoffs for their added intensity and, and how locked in they've looked on the defensive side of the ball. But at the end of the day, like those are not guys that you can switch one through five. Josh Green is not a guy who can switch one through five. Let's keep it a buck. PJ is not a guy you can really switch that much either. And on top of the fact that I've watched Drew Holiday back him down underneath <laughs> the basket. Yeah. Like little things like that cannot be happening because if I can't feel comfortable with PJ Washington guarding a point guard in the mm-hmm. post, like the answers get harder and harder to find for the Mavericks. So if I'm Jason Kidd, that is like the number one thing that I'm taking away from this game. Like the switching cannot happen at the level that it was in this game because it they're just y'all don't have the personnel to be able to do that. Um, you're gonna have to find other ways to take Chris Apps out of the game because I understand you you won't want to get burned on the pick and pop, but Josh Green guarding him in the post is not the answer. Yeah, no, nah, I agree 100%. Like, they kind of had to find a way because, like I said, the biggest thing for me was the Celtics got whatever they wanted. Like, they can, were able to play their style of basketball. When you do that, it's over because they have you uh, chase, like, clo- chasing closeouts to the point where they're getting wide open threes because they're moving the ball. Realistically, with the Mavs, like I said, they do have to find a way to play better defense. And on offense, they got to find a way to – one, I, I agree. I think Kyrie has to really get it going, especially if they're going to play in a way that kind of takes everyone else out of the game. And it's like, all right, we're fine leaving Luka Kyrie one-on-one in this, like, pick-and-roll type of thing. We're not giving up the lob. We're not stepping up to stop that little floater. Um, and we're not, like I said, over-helping to the point where you get wide-open threes. So they're going to have to get it going with those two superstars because if you're that's what they're going to give you, you're going to have to take that and then really kind of hone in on a defensive end. Um, but in reality – even if you guys, <clears throat> excuse me, even if you guys do play well as far as your two superstars, though the assist numbers have to go up. Like, you still got to find a way to at least get something from your other guys. Like, something out of P.J. Washington, something out of maybe Derrick Jones Jr., just something in general. Um, So they got to find a way to, at, at least if you get to the point where Luke and Kyrie are killing you on that pick and roll because you don't want to step up and help, at least try to force them into doing something different. You know what I mean? But that starts with Luke and Kyrie both having it going, both playing their brand of basketball. Which I think they can do. Um, that's the main reason. I think I think both of those guys are obviously definitely Luca. Um, I think Kyrie's gonna bounce back. Like I said, it's it's Boston. They've actually had his number. What he's lost to them, what like eleven times in a row or something yeah, like that. Like, yep. I didn't even realize that. I didn't well, either. It, it makes sense though when he was in Brooklyn getting swept. They got swept. <laughs> yeah, that's four he, right there. <laughs> exactly. And he did not have a good series, too. People bash Kevin Durant about that series. He did not have a good series either. Like Boston's Ooh. like length and, and defensive ability definitely frustrates him a little bit. But again, he has some open looks. Like he had a couple wide open threes. Even when they were going in their run, like he made that one three and like I think it was like the left wing, I want to say. Like that would that would have been huge. I think that might have cut the lead to five, I want to say. Yeah, I no, what it would have. Like, that would have been huge. He's missing wide open shots. So, I think he was just kind of – not definitely not rattled. I don't think he's rattled. He's been here way – he's been here too before. He's not rattled. But right. just just off. His game was just off. So, I just think they need their two two superstars to do their thing and they kind of force Boston to make adjustments because right now, if you're if they're going to play this way, like, they're perfectly fine with letting Luka get 30 on, like, 25 shots. Like, they're fine with that and having one assist. Like, they will take – because Luka's going to get his regardless. So, they would take that and not have the teammates involved, no lobs, no open threes, 10 times out of 10 because they will win every single game. It's like that. So, they just have to find a way, realistically, to just play their brand of basketball. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be tough. It's going to be very tough. And I think you've mentioned it a couple times now, but it's definitely a clash of styles in this matchup. And um, the, the Celtics forced the Mavericks to play the way that – or to play a way that they don't want to. Yeah. Um, and to your point, the Mavericks are going to have to try to find a way to generate – uh, more flow and rhythm throughout their offense because nine assists is not, it's not going to cut it. It's not going to cut it. And it, it feels like 
a recurring theme. Anytime you get someone who is so dynamic as a scorer and a passer that the conversation inevitably comes up about the pick your poison. What do you want to do? Do you want to leave guy on, guy, a guy on an island to guard him? Or do you want to take away his alternative options and just say, you're, you're just going to have to beat us. And it felt like the Celtics came out and made a statement that they were not going to allow that supporting cast for guys like PJ Washington and Derek Jones, Jr. Josh Green, you know, Jaden Hardy, Tim Hardaway came in and got um, his shot blocked. Like, they're not allowing the other guys to get it off so freely um, because you are, even if you allow everybody to get involved, Luke is still going to eat. He's still going to get his either way. Um, so if you are able to kind of choke out the flow of their offense and eliminate, you know, some of those, again, back to the corner threes, but just those easy uh, kick passes coming off of some of those high screen roll actions, I think Boston will live with that 10 times out of 10, and they're going to be in a very good spot um, in this series. I do also want to shout out, while we did just talk about uh, guys who are switchable, Al Horford. (laughs) The man just – we be talking about LeBron, you know, whooping up on father time. (laughs) Al Horford just – he how is he still this effective, bro? I don't know, bro. It it literally doesn't make sense. Like, he should be – super wide. He, yeah like i said he is one of those guys that's definitely beating father time at least a little bit because he is very very I mean, more than serviceable very very effective in big time moments and also if you're Luca and Kyrie, that there's no way al horford should be able to switch on to you and that's not a bucket i'm sorry like he's way too old like that gotta be a bucket but to his credit he's definitely holding his own for sure yeah he he i think he got a block on luca too right off a of mm-hmm. step back Off-foot. three yep mm-hmm. um which like they got stop on another possession. <laughs> yeah, it's like I said, that can't happen, bro. I'm sorry, I was way too old. He can't, that can't happen. I'm sorry. Yeah, he finishes up 10.7 rebounds, three assists, two blocks. He always knocks down those corner threes, but the shooting form is crazy, bro. It's like, but you know what, though? Like, honestly, I really think it was like the Celtics really got a lot from everybody though cuz wasn't it Hauser got some stops on Luka and on a No, like, he did and he's knocking down no dip threes out of the corner like Bro, like they just had, like I said that it was just a great all-around team win, bro, cuz it was like they had no holes, no weaknesses that game. Like it was everyone was was it's like a well-oiled machine. So they just honestly I, they just had a really good all-around game, bro. It was really nothing that, that was their game, bro. I'm gonna be honest. Right. And that and we'll kind of pivot this into starting to, you know, preview game two a little bit, but that, you know, each team can pull, obviously it's easier for the Celtics to pull good from this game, having won. but even if you want to say like, okay, well, there, there's no way that everybody, all these role players are going to perform at this level every game, especially when it goes to Dallas, because as the saying goes, role players always play better at home. You can easily just make the argument. Well, we did all this. And again, Six field goals for Jason Tatum, 16 points. All right. We got we got great performances from the role players, and our 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 guy ain't even have to go crazy. Mm-hmm. That's still in the chamber for a later date. Exactly. Um, so let, let's let's talk game two. I want to start obviously from the Maverick side of things. What are some of the biggest adjustments um that you feel like they need to do going into game two to try to get a split um in Boston and go? tied um one one in the series heading into to Dallas for game three. I think realistically it comes down to like I said finding a way to play your style of basketball. Um particularly on the offensive end, like I said before, I think it really comes down to Luke and Kyrie getting it going because if they're really gonna cut off the lobs and not over help and leave on open threes, you gotta find a way to kind of abuse that pick and roll if they're gonna leave you that space with those floaters, putting guys in jail, just getting your shot for yourself. Um, it could get to a point where they can tell us like, look, we're still gonna live with that, even if you guys have it going, because we think we can beat two people. Um, but you have to at least try to find a way for them to make some sort of adjustment. Um, and that's only gonna come with Luca and Kyrie playing well off of that. Um, and then like I said, really it's the ball movement, like the what is it? What was they had nine assists total? Yep. 
nine assists are not going to cut it. You're not going to win any game doing nine assists. Luca is not. Y'all not going to win any game with Luca having one assist. So even with that, like I said, that's why I feel like if Luca and Kyrie get themselves going, it's going to open stuff up for the other players on the team to where now they're moving the ball. Um, they're getting some open looks. Maybe you get them to the point where they have to help at least a little bit. Maybe the lob is there, um, but they have to get, <clears throat> excuse me, get back to at least playing their style of basketball. Um, because right now Boston, like I said, for game one, they played their brand of basketball and that really can't happen. So you got to find a way to play your style of basketball in the offensive end. And again, you got to get some stops. You got to get some stops because when mm-hmm. Boston has it rolling like that and then they're kind of getting whatever they want in the offensive end, it's going to be tough to beat them. Again, some of it really just is a personnel thing. Like Boston just plays a certain type of way with the five out, with everyone being able to shoot to where it's just – Sometimes it's just tough, bro. Like, they're really that good of a team. But yep. you have to find a way to make them uncomfortable and not have them playing their style of basketball. I think that one of the big things that's going to have to change, and it's minor to an extent, but I think that Derek Lively is the best option on the court because I like him a lot better in space, especially if he has to go up to the perimeter to guard right. – because you're not guarding – it's not like you're playing against Rudy Gobert screens now. It's, you know it's, it's a dive every time. Rudy Gobert's mm. not popping. Right. Chris Stapps has that option, but obviously he's even more dangerous as a popper. And then even if, you know, anything all else fails, he still can be an effective player facing up or posting up. So I like Derek or, – or, yeah, Derek Lively being in that position, having to go up and cover more ground and play out on the perimeter more than I like Daniel Gafford. The issue here is that Derek Lively picked up five fouls in 18 minutes of gameplay, and I said I think three or four of those fouls were in like a four or five minute stretch. Where, again, to his credit, Jalen Brown is getting downhill and just going up in his chest and continually getting Derek Lively to to hit him on the arm. He's not going up vertically. So if I'm Jason Kidd, I would get in his ear immediately and be like, "Look, you're too valuable to pick up this many fouls. Like you gotta." I have him watching Roy Hibbert tape. We are hmm. going up vertically. They a score, tip your cap, but we need you on the court because I do not think they can sustain winning in this series if you're only able to get 18 minutes out of him. Because I don't I I don't know, especially with his shoulder if Cleaver is the best option because he does not look comfortable shooting at all. So that becomes a no. huge detriment on the offensive side of the ball. And like I said, I just, I like him in space a lot more than Gafford. Um, so I think that is one of the bigger things that Dallas has to address going into, into game two. Cause he's, I think he's, he's going to be one of the more pivotal pieces um, for the Mavericks. If they look to have any success in this series. Yeah, 100%. I agree. I definitely think he looks more comfortable when he's out there on the perimeter versus Gaffer. Um, but yeah, the biggest thing is really going to be foul trouble because he's still a young player at the end of the day. Right. Um, it's still his first time in the finals. It's his first time in the NBA still, even though obviously we're still impressed by what he's doing as a rookie. Um, but guys obviously noticed that, like you said, with Jalen Brown attacking him and making him get pick up those quick fouls. Um, so that's going to be an adjustment. Is he able to stay on the court? But I do agree, though. I think as far as just adjustment, like lineup wise, I think that's the best possible thing just because you're going to have to find a way to kind of neutralize what Persingas is doing, being able to pop out and shoot from damn near half court while still have the ability to roll. So, like I said, the biggest thing is can you stop Boston from playing the way they want to play? Um, and you need the personnel to do that. And then Lively is obviously the best option for him. Right, and I, I almost would even think for stints in the game, I would be interested to see more um, if they ran a lineup that was like Luka, Kyrie, it could be Josh Green or, you know, Jane Hardy or, uh, you know, Hardaway, Exum, whatever, you know, works. Like they can try different things or, you know, Jason Kidd sees whatever he likes in practice. But I'd like to see PJ at the five on Chris Stapps, and see what that looks like at least for a little bit. Um, Because I think on the flip side, it puts them in a position where they could also five out to an extent. Um, Mm -hmm. And then if you are bringing Porzingis up into that action with Luka, that's something that could potentially get exploitable 
more so than what they were able to do in this game, obviously, because a lot of the, the time was spent with, you know, Gaffer or Lively or Kleba on the court. And at this point in time, I think it's fair to say Kleba is a non-shooter. So right. They just, three, there's no, there's no shooters. from Right. You got three home. different bigs um, who, you know, are, are going to dive to the rim and you're not right. able to get that, that full kind of open court spacing that you could. Um, so I, I think that's something worthwhile to, to look into um, and, and see how that plays out in game two, because if I'm Jason Kidd, that's something I would go to because uh, j- just the opportunity that that presents on the offensive side of the ball, even if it's not the most sound defensive lineup, if you're able to get offensive flow off of that, you may just net out more positives um, in the long run, even mm-hmm. if PJ is obviously giving up some size on the inside. And like I said, that Drew Holiday play really like, I was, wow, no <laughs> way you just let Drew Holiday back yeah. down like that. No, um, it, it it would make sense. Especially in like spurts too, to at least try it out. Um, right. especially to see if that helps out open stuff up in the offensive end. Because in reality, I mean, if you're taking out Gafford and Lively, like you're really you're taking out rim protection. But the way that Boston plays with the five out, like you're not really getting much rim protection anyway. Right. So the biggest thing, like I said, would be Chris Swaps with that little mismatch down there. But it's if it opens stuff up on the offensive end, I think it's a good choice to at least try it in spurts um mm-hmm. especially if you just can't get anything going really um so yeah, it's interesting definitely interesting jason kidd is has yeah, you got a tall task to really see what the proper adjustments are but i'm I'm definitely willing to see it at least in spurts and then maybe game two definitely uh and look to joe Missoula's credit because i know he got a lot of heat for this before he called a timeout uh, when the Mavericks were going on that long run after they cut it to um, back down to single digits and like calmed them down. And then obviously the Celtics came out and went on a run of their own to extend the lead back out to 20 plus and never really looked back from there. Um, so want to make sure that he gets uh, noticed for that because he's been a guy that has been under the microscope ever since he took over this position, obviously coming off of a finals appearance as an assistant with Ime at the helm. Um, with that, though, game two in Boston Sunday night, what are your initial feelings for how that game is going to go? I think that you're going to get a better game from Luka and Kyrie. I think that's what's going to happen. Um, I think that they're going to make it a point to move the ball and get more ball movement because obviously you can't have nine assists and win a basketball game. So I think they're going to do a better job of that. Um, defensively, uh, it's tough to see what adjustments they are going to make. Um, it's easy to say, like, yeah, they're going to try to play better defense with Boston. But it's like like I said, some of it really just comes down to personnel and the way Boston plays. And it's like I said, it's a clash of styles. Um, so it might be a lineup adjustment maybe with Lively in there or just however they want to do it. Um, but I do think I think you get a better game out of Dallas with your stars as well. Um whether it be them getting it going for themselves or creating for others. So I think you're going to see that. I think if you're Boston, <laughs> Boston's tough because, like, this is, like, the perfect game for them to lose. Like, they look unbeatable game one. They look like, oh, my God, they can't lose. They're, like, the best team in the world, and they come out and lose game two. They lost every, what, they lost every game two except for the Pacers series. Um, yeah. So they lost – the Cavs and they lost to who they played. I didn't even realize that. Yeah, they did. They lost to the Heat in Game Two Heat, and they lost to the was. Cavs in Game Two. And Jason Kidd and the Mavs off of a loss. I don't think they're. I think they're undefeated off of a loss, or they're just they're a great team off. Yeah, of they've they've been really bad in Game One. Like that's kind of been Jason Kidd's mo too. So that's their thing. They use it as like the fill out game. So mm-hmm. I, I can I can really see a world where the Mavs win this game. Um. I don't know. I, I think I see a world where they can they can steal one here because I just think this is when you get the not let down from the Celtics, but they kind of relax at least a little bit because in reality they still haven't been the greatest home team the past few years in the playoffs, mm-hmm. which is so weird to me because I feel like when the threes are falling and that, that stadium not stadium but that uh, arena gets going, like it's a tough place to play. So it's like so weird how they like to lose games at home, and then the Mavs has been a really good road team. So I can see a world, especially coming off of a loss, that Jason Kidd makes some adjustments. Luke and Kyrie, Luke didn't play terrible, but um, obviously his he didn't get many assists. He didn't get his teammates going, and then Kyrie just flat out didn't play a good game. I could see a world where they play better, um, they get it going, and they win one, and they kind of steal one, and they go back to Dallas kind of tied. But in that same standpoint, I could see a world where it doesn't matter what adjustment you make, 
the way the Celtics play basketball and with their personnel, it's just going to be tough. <laughs> like, it's just nothing right. you could really do. So I can see a world where both of those things happen. I think I lean the Mavericks side just because of the way the Mavericks play off of a loss and the way they've been playing on the road in the playoffs and the way the Celtics tend to ease up a little bit in situations where they feel like they have at least somewhat control. Mm -hmm. I think I agree. There is going to be a game in times where we do see the Celtics look discombobulated a bit, and especially those shots just don't fall. I'm more inclined to believe that that probably happens in game three, and that's where Dallas probably first gets on the board. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that they they defend home court. I think I'm going to stay with Boston here in game two. And I think that that first game in Dallas, crowd is going to be rocking. Like we just said, role players are going to be playing better. I just think you get some boosted performance from P.J. or yeah. Tim Hardaway. Somebody just comes in and knocks down a couple threes. All of a sudden, Derek White misses a couple. Tatum struggles, JB struggles. So, like, they just threes are not falling at the same clip that they were in Boston, and that's where Matt, the, the Mavs first get on the board. But um, I, I'm just super, super interested to see what type of adjustments both coaches are going to make going into game two because I think there was a lot uh, that happened game one to, to you know, use his takeaways um, and tweak. This is always one of my favorite parts of the finals is just that chess match game to game. Um, and you have two very good coaches um, on both sides of the ball in two very versatile rosters that give them a lot of options at their disposal. Um, so super, super excited to see what game two is going to bring. Now that we have given y'all 50 plus minutes of strictly NBA finals coverage, I do unfortunately have to talk about the Los Angeles Lakers. Because oh, I'm like, whoa, what do we do? <laughs> now I remember. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, it had been reported by Shams for weeks now that JJ Reddick is a guy the Lakers really like. They like him. And then all of a sudden it was it came down to him and James Borrego. And then it was like dead set. It's gonna be JJ Reddick, the next head coach of the Los Angeles Lakers. And Wolves had just been sitting on it. He'd been sitting on it apparently for weeks because he said that this has been this way for the, the entirety of their search. And he let it out early. It was like 4 or 5 a.m., 6 a.m. East Coast um, when he put out the tweet. And he said that the Lakers are actually looking to pursue. And their top candidate is current UConn men's basketball head coach, back-to-back -back two time national champion Dan Hurley. So I'm asking you as a Lakers fan, how are you, what was your initial reaction to having, you know, I think you probably were at the point where you're just now really starting to accept the fact that JJ Reddick is really about to be y'all's head coach. And you oh, got the notification that <laughs> actually it's not JJ. It's a guy who just came off with two national championships and they are supposedly putting together a very, very lucrative and long-term deal in place for him to, to hopefully lure him away from stores, Connecticut and into warm and sunny LA. I was relieved <laughs> to see it <laughs> because man, I thought the guy was an unserious franchise for a moment. You know what I mean? And Hey, who knows? Like, listen, nothing set in stone. So JJ no, could very possibly be our head coach, but, um, Nah, man. I mean, honestly, I don't. I don't watch that much college basketball. I'm be honest. Like a lot of men's basketball, for sure. I watch more college women, women's basketball at this point. But um, so, like I said, I'm not obviously. I'm familiar with UConn. I'm familiar with you know them winning. I'm familiar with or with the the program. Um, not too familiar with Dan Hurley that much. Um, but definitely would be a good candidate as far as clearly been able to win. Um, at the college level. Obviously has coach good coaching experience, head coaching mm -hmm. experience versus a guy like JJ Reddick. Cool. I don't want to make it seem like I don't think JJ Reddick can ever be a good coach in the NBA because he's obviously a good basketball mind. He obviously knows basketball, but he's never coached before. Like he's right. he's never coached in any form of anything in the NBA before. Like he's not like an assistant, nothing. Like he just went from like playing the league doing a podcast, being on ESPN, commentating, coaching yeah. a little AAU team, and now he's about to be the head coach of the Los Angeles Lakers. Like, I just don't think that's smart mm -hmm. for a first-time head coach because 
honestly, the name couldn't name it. Name doesn't have to be JJ Reddick. Any if you tell me anybody who never coached before is going to come in and coach one of the Los Angeles Lakers to the LeBron James led Los, Los Angeles, Angeles Lakers. Yeah. With title aspirations, because in reality, when you have LeBron and AD there, you're always going to be championship or bust kind of 100%. Thing. That's just not a good situation for a first-time guy to be in, let alone a first-time guy who's never even been like an assistant, mm-hmm. like anything ever. Like, if he, was, if he was to take like the Hornets job or whatever, like that when he was supposed to take that job, like, all right, who cares? This is the Hornets. Like, you can lose all you want. Like, you're honestly, you're just learning how to be a head coach at that point. Who really cares? But there, you have so much pressure on you in LA to like win and produce, and you're gonna get scapegoated if it doesn't work out. Like it's just too much for a first time guy. Um, and that's not even to mention the fact that bro, he's doing a podcast with LeBron, so now it's just like <laughs> it's just mad weird. Like it's right. just mad weird. Like I don't, I just, I just didn't like the situation. Put it that way. Like, could it have worked out? I hope so. Obviously, I'm, I would be rooting for him. I hopefully he doesn't go bad. But I can easily see a world where it it looks horrible on JJ, the organization, the like everybody. I can see where it looks horrible. So to get somebody in here, hopefully, who obviously is, has a little um, better credentials, I should say, um, it would just it would it would ensure me that the Lakers are a serious franchise right now versus a team that's just trying to make headlines because the JJ Reddick hire is like. Headlines, really. Uh, uh, I said it's like a social media hire versus a guy in Dan Hurley who would be, okay, we're actually trying to, one, have a long-term solution at head coach, not just like oh, we're going to hire somebody and hopefully it works out and probably fire him in a couple years. Like, no. Hopefully a long-term solution, someone who's coached basketball before and someone who will be more respected in, like, the NBA. Um, so it, it ensured me of that. But then again, nothing set in stone. He can very well back out, and then we're doing coach player podcasts. We're watching with Mind the Game. So I I don't really know what to think right now. I just want to see breaking. Dan Hurley has agreed to terms. You saw, you saw what the contract was? It was like eight years. Well, I don't know if it was real, but it said like eight years, $100 million or something crazy. I did not see that. That's crazy. I don't know if it was real. I literally just seen like a couple. I don't know. So, but, yeah. So hopefully I see that pretty soon. Like breaking, he agrees to terms, and then. Cool. We up. Who is the last coach that you can remember that had basically no coaching experience that got a head coaching gig in the NBA? Was it Steve Nash? I believe it was Steve Nash. And that shit went terribly. <laughs> it went horrible. <laughs> oh my god, it was bad. And the same kind of situation they had KD. Right. You just kind of you like, have big KD. aspirations. You got to deal with big egos. Right. Right. Um, it's not. It's not a good spot to be in. Nah, bro. Even if you are a great basketball mind like Steve Nash or J.J. Redick, I think it's very clear nobody's disputing J.J.'s basketball IQ or even his ability to coach. Like, I think from the bits and pieces that you see behind the curtain of him getting to talk X's and O's on his podcast with LeBron or even on his own podcast when he you know brings on and interviews guests or talks with guys like Tim Legler, like, he very, very is clearly, to use his own words, a basketball sicko, um, but is a guy who really appreciates the X's and O's and understands basketball at the highest of levels. But that's not the only requirement to being a head coach. Mm-hmm. Like, there's some people would genuinely argue that being a head coach is just as, and at times, more importantly, understanding how to be a people manager than being Mm -hmm. a X's and O's guy. And that's why you, as some, some coaches who have seen great success, get that moniker of being a player's coach and just understand how to be a leader of men and can galvanize a locker room, can control egos, can, you know, squash out any type of, you know, fighting or anything that's going on. Like that's a very critical part of the role too. And to your point, she just never done that at, at any level above to what we know, like you, I don't even know if it's AAU. I know he coaches his son's teams. I'm pretty sure his sons are like eight or nine. They're like 10 years old. Bro. Right. It's just like, that's a drastic difference. Like not having any type of, not even high school level coaching experience. 
Um, so I completely agree with you. I think that it would I, I would like it a lot better if he went and took a job with a team that didn't have as much pressure because Darvin Ham made the Western Conference Finals and then got eliminated by that same team in the next year. Both of those series were like, yes, one was a four-game series, one was a five-game series, but they were vo- both close series. Immediately got the rug pulled out from under him. Frank Vogel won a championship with the Lakers and had a down year, rug pulled out from under him. That type of leash is just not – it doesn't work in L.A. It doesn't work. So it just feels like what could be a period for him to get acclimated and develop. You don't don't get that time there, bro, because like you said, it's a LeBron winner now, like winner bust mode with LeBron anyway – Especially winter bus because LeBron don't have a ton of time left playing professional basketball. He's mm-hmm. going to be 40 next year. That's crazy to <laughs> That's even crazy. say out loud. Let me That's crazy. Player. If also, if he makes all NBA as a 40 year old, that is, bro, that's a forget the 40,000 points, forget all of that. 40 years all old. All NBA. He's, he's already playing against people who, He's literally played more time in the NBA than they have just being alive on planet Earth, bro. It's That's <laughs> crazy to wrap your mind around. He's and not, it's not even like he just he not Vince Carter. He not checking into the game to check up a 40-foot three because the world shutting down from COVID so he could get one good send-off. It's like, no, I'm still a top 10 player in the league. And you know what's the, the crazy part about it is? And it's not like, bro – he could retire tomorrow, and that would be normal from like a normal thirty-nine year old standpoint. I, people really are like, yeah, like Bron still got like two, three more years left. Like if people are not like realizing, like, bro, he could really if he retires. To, matter of fact, if he comes out next year and it absolutely falls off the face of the earth, that's normal. Like talent wise, right. that's normal. Like it's people supposed would be like, to have happened exactly. years ago. And, but, but if it happened, people would be like, "Whoa, Bron, what? Like you supposed to be all, like you supposed to be right. top ten player? <laughs> He's thirty nine. That's that's just crazy. When you really think about it, that shit's insane, bro. It's wild. So yeah, the the leash is very short. Doesn't does not have much time. Yeah, to put. Uh, an end to the the coaching specific conversation with Dan Hurley. It, it's clear if you watch the episode that uh, on Mind the Game where they talked about UConn, like LeBron seems to be a fan of some sort um, with Dan Hurley. He liked what UConn's offense looked like while Dan Hurley's been the head coach. Dan Hurley is a very hands on coach and a very vocal head coach um, from the bits and pieces that we've gotten, like him mic'd up or just like behind the scenes at UConn. Like he is like, uh, there's a clip of him screaming, like everybody get in my huddle now. Like he's a guy that is not going to just be an X's and O's coach, which is obviously necessary, but he it seems like he has those intangibles to be like a for real, for real leader, a leader of men. Right. Which is what I think you, the best coaches, like epitomize both of those things. As long as you um, so, guys' hands in his pockets, man, get your hand out your damn pockets. <laughs> I saw somebody, <laughs> some Lakers fan was like, "Just watch five minutes of a UConn game." Didn't see Dan really put his hands in his pockets once. I'm in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bro. I listen. I was bought in when I peeped that he was the same guy. You remember that clip where he's like, "Yeah, yeah, man." Hype slapped the dude and immediately. Good game. Good game. Good game. Yeah. So I didn't realize it was him. As soon as I see that, I was like, I bought in. Yeah. Throw the house at him, bro. I'm bought in, bro. We're here. No, it look, it, it would be a great move, I think, for the Lakers. I think it's better than all the alternatives that have been there. I don't really care for James Rego. I don't again, I don't think JJ Reddick. Not to say that James Rego's a bad coach. I don't want to dismiss him. I just think Dan Harley is a, a better hire. Um, again, I think JJ Reddick could be a great coach. I don't think this is a great first stop. Um and I just think if they're really committed to how Woj has reported of it being a long-term deal with obviously the idea that he's going to be a the coach for the Lakers for a long time. This isn't some trial period where he has to prove himself. They're going to give him more leash than they've given their most recent coaches in the last few years. I think it makes a ton, a ton of sense uh, for the Lakers. It will be a huge, huge move for L.A., um, 
because the Clippers unlocked up Ty Lu, which is another name that was kind of somewhat rumored a bit too. That was um, I'd, yeah, that would have been crazy. Um, that'd have been the wildest little bro move from the Lakers. <laughs> like, take the Clippers coach. <laughs> like, <laughs> I would have loved it though. I'm telling you that I would have loved it, bro. But that was never gonna happen. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Dan Hurley would be a great move for the Lakers if they give him the proper space and time to get acclimated to the NBA to allow him to look further past what is the end of the LeBron era because that has to come at some point. Um, but yeah, another thing I do want to talk about, um, and this is very brief because I don't want to put too much stock in it, but I did see that uh, – Bronny James is taking draft workouts, I think, only with the Lakers and the Suns. And there have been rumors that the Suns would take him to pair him with KD and then potentially try to lure LeBron to Phoenix to have a KD, Bradley Beal, Devin Booker, and LeBron team with the Suns. Any thoughts or we could could move past that? What are we doing here? <laughs> I do want to say though, I do want to say, Bronny, why the hell are you only taking two workouts? Yeah, you are, you're not of the caliber to be picking. I mean, you're LeBron's son, so you kind of I don't but. think to be fair, I don't think any recruit should be out here declining workouts at that level. Like, I get I, I you, thinking yeah. behind it, but like to me, just the like it just feels like a bad look. Yeah, like what are you saying no to like no, I'm not working out with you. You ain't in the league yet. What are you talking right. about? Unless you're like like Caleb Williams in the NFL, right? You don't want to work out for – actually, yeah. you don't even know because who? what if they trade up? Like, you just don't know. Like, I think you should right. just take Unless you got that absolute promise, like the Hawks is on the clock. They talking to whoever, Alex Saw or something. They like, bro, we are taking like, you out. Like, win me one. with the Spurs. Win me with right. the Spurs. Go, get, get your agent. Go start looking at a crib like you're right, coming yeah. to Atlanta. We're taking if you get that type of promise – Cool. I don't. I don't. Not taking no workouts. I'm not even gonna waste y'all's time. Mm. It's not a. It's not even a. A selfish thing. Like if you are, I'm not. I'm not time. gonna be there. Don't even send a scout, bro. Right. Like, <laughs> if you are just out here being like, man, I ain't trying. You already got a point guard. Don't draft me, bro. Like, I anywhere. feel like that's not the way to approach those types of situations. Like, mm. even when you get those those news stories of like. Agents telling you know front offices like don't draft my guy he's not he's not gonna be happy it's like bro y'all don't who are you uh, right I don't I, see in, like, maybe I feel like I'm coming draft. off like an old head but it's like that's just not you get that's the point of the draft bro you don't get to decide you go to a situation you make the most of it from there you have you free agency later you don't have the leeway to do like you're just not of that caliber to be doing that so definitely Bronny like I get it like you're Bron's son so you like. You have that pass, but like, if you were talking about just your skill set, bro, you're lucky to be in the league. I'm gonna be honest with you. So, because a lot of people feel like you shouldn't even have came out to get drafted, but it is what it is. I I am still surprised that he didn't go back to to USC or enter the transfer portal or or something. I think he could really benefit from that extra time. I think even still, like he is a draftable prospect, but he is going to be a project, right? And he's gonna be a late second round guy like i would be absolutely stunned if a team took him anywhere in the first round i'd pretty be i'd be stunned if they took him within the first 40 picks Mm -hmm. and if a team does that what and it's such that this is going to be the combo but it's going to be like they doing it just to get lebron because that's that that would almost feel like that's what it is because like why else are you making that reach even though at the same time i do think he is a guy who could be a really impactful nba player in his career but what he's shown and obviously he had the you know the health issue at usc which obviously you know took away from some of the time that he was able to to put film out you know in college but from what he's shown it just isn't it's not all there yet like you said it's going to be a bit of a project for him to develop all of that I mean, if we just live in the hypothetical world, if LeBron say, yo, bro, whoever draft my son, I'm coming no matter what minimum contract. How high would he go from that standpoint? Like, because then, then it's like, it's not like you're, it's like you're drafting LeBron. You're drafting a year of LeBron. Like, yeah. Let me, let me look at the draft order. Cause like, I really, Atlanta has the first pick. 
if you're a team like this is gonna sound crazy. If you're a team like the Wizards, right? If you if you knew for a fact you getting LeBron for a minimum contract, what what's the harm, bro? Y'all already gonna stink. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like <laughs> your, your fan base would be jumping. They DC would be, jumping. would be buzzing. The owners gotta be thinking about the money. To me, though, if I'm like but then, like, Wimby future. I'm thinking, like, San Antonio, if you think about it. Like, no, I, could you but imagine it, it be, LeBron in a Spurs jersey? It would be disgusting. Don't get me wrong. But, like, he could help Wimby out. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. But I feel like you you rather use that. Like, you have your LeBron, like, projected. Like, you're, you have your, like, generational talent. Like, you rather just get pieces to build around him. Like, realistically, actually, you know, they got a two picks. They go on a four and eight. Oh, I'm taking them with the eighth. Oh my god, I'm taking Brian with the eighth. I'm the Spurs. The fourth, <laughs> I was like, ah, eh, the eighth. Yeah, I'm taking him with the eighth. But reality, like, if I'm a contender, OKC at twelve, he's getting drafted. You can tell me I can get the team I got now and add Bromfrey. I'm one hundred percent taking him that twelve. That's he's fair. Not That's passing fair. He's not passing twelve. If he did. Yeah. Even like the, a, that'd be a wild upgrade from Josh Giddy. <laughs> insane. Take out Josh Giddy. Insert LeBron. <laughs> what well, that team is insane. But yeah, after yeah. that, if I'm a contender, yeah, I'm doing it. Hundred percent. I say it's not hypothetical because. But he wouldn't go like if he was to go to a team on the minimum contract. Why the hell would he go to the Suns of all places? Like, I'm going to the Nuggets or something. Like I'm going like somewhere. It's like I'm a really. I'm going to the Mavs. Like I'm going somewhere where I can really win a ring. If I'm going for. Yeah. If I'm Brian, I'm taking a minimum because you're gonna get killed if you take a minimum. You're LeBron. People are gonna be like, "Oh, ring chasing." Da, 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 da. He gonna get killed wherever he go. He get killed. Like, in, he, he got killed for going to LA. <laughs> like, you're not wrong. Yeah, <laughs> we wasn't supposed to win nothing either. I was with like Lonzo and all them, so yeah. you're not wrong. But yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not gonna tell damn sons. The hell. Yeah, I, I couldn't believe when I seen that report. I was like, bro, what? Get Matt Ishbia up out of I, here, bro. I believe it because it's Matt Ishbia. That's why I believe it. He done turned this lunatic. organization upside down, bro. He's a lunatic, bro. This <laughs> is insane. Bro, he just like he just seemed like a guy who was like mad rich and just got bored and was like, I'm just about to like flip shit in the NBA. Like, we'll see what happens. Let's get KD, trade everybody with. Let's just see what happens, bro. Like, he's just he's crazy. Yeah, I just wild, bro. Wild. Did you see KD doing a jab step pull up in the club, bro? <laughs> I did. Yes, I did. Ball is really life. Hooper's Hooper, bro. He is a Hooper's Hooper. I think Kevin Durant is the most hoopest of Hoopers ever. Like he's he, like he's the hoopiest Hooper. <laughs> yeah. He is the hoopiest Hooper. Like he is like basketball like that is like he is basketball i'll put it that way like he is basketball he le- eats sleep breathes basketball like to the fullest extent yeah to, to be in a club and that's your go-to a little uh, rock you know what i'm saying it's like that's crazy <laughs> that is funny that's funny as hell Oh, he was in the man. club, like fake dribbling through people, like just. <laughs> excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse, oh, excuse me. Like... That's oh funny, man, um, I don't know. This is, this is always the most interesting part of doing these podcasts. We only got one series, one game to cover. You get a lot of extra time. Is there anything else you want to talk about before we get up out of here? Hmm. Anything basketball wise. I'm trying to think of anything. <laughs> I guess this is why people do like the narrative shit because like <laughs> when it comes to actual basketball, like we talked about the actual basketball already. Right. Um, the only other thing that I had thought about potentially bringing up, but I don't even know if I want to open the can of worms because the discourse has been wild. Is all the, the Caitlin Clark stuff and the I WBA. literally thought about that. I, I don't even want that. to go down that rabbit hole. Man, that's like that because now we're talking gender, race. Like that's right. Like, it's getting out of pocket. Man. The only take that I will reiterate that I've seen that I think is fair is what Matt Bourne said. Which is look, yeah. ba- basketball is physical, it's violent. The WNBA bend this way. He said the biggest thing that he took away was, yo, where are her teammates at, bro? Which That's is right. fair. Like, imagine if that happened to Steph. 
Draymond, oh, Draymond about is put, he about to put the gloves on? He's right? like, wowing. What Draymond is? What Draymond might go to jail? <laughs> that right. happens, Steph, he might go to prison. So I ain't gonna say nothing more on it other than if you somebody else on the fever, bro. Somebody got swing on something, bro. They out of pocket, just they, well, her, called her bro, that, bro. and then mm, right in her back. Nah, somebody gotta get shoved, pushed, slapped, punched. Not that I'm advocating for violence, but. You gotta set a tone, bro, or else they just gonna bully you. Bro, I'm not gonna lie. At yeah, WNBA is just, it's a tough with that specific it's a tough topic, man. If we talk WNBA, AJ Wilson a bucket. Let's put it that way. Right. Bucket or Rike a bucket. Rike bucket. bucket. Yes, yes. She's That's my favorite player in the league. Bucket. That's my favorite player in the league. I swear to God. I, I love that it's getting so much more attention because it's like, bro, people have been saying this for a long time. It's like, bro, she is a who. Burr. But mm. now that there's so many more eyes on the W this year, so people are really being like, yo, hold up. Who is who that? Is that? Exactly. Yes, bro. Yeah. Yes, bro. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad y'all are seeing it. Asia Wilson, it, she had was like a 35, 10, and 5. Was it steal or block game? I think um, it was a block. I might have been. No, 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 steal. It was steals. It was steals, yeah. Bro, she's leading the league in, in points and rebounds right now. She's, a, she's averaging 28 points. Bro, WNBA games are 40 minutes. <laughs> Bro, you know, she's on isn't she on pace to like lead like have the highest like scoring season or something like that? I forgot what I don't even was. know, but that is nuts. 20. She she jumped her average up almost six points. Like off of what I'm pretty she was the was she the MVP last year? I don't remember what's off my head. She was slow. uh it was something like that. I can't remember. She's been the best player in the WNBA for some time now. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's still getting better. Great. Wild. On a team that is absurdly stacked. It makes me sad because, bro, the Aces really used to be in San Antonio. And when I came to San Antonio, I think they were still here when I came down for college my freshman year. And then they sold them to the group that moved them to Vegas. And it's like, now that's the WNBA team. It's like pain all the way in Vegas, bro. I could have right. been watching Kelsey Plum and Asia Wilson and them, but Becky Hammond back. To, it's a dynasty there. Back to back mm-hmm. champion looking for a three peat. Right. It's wild. But yeah, it's if y'all are not tapped into the W, especially because now we got these two day breaks between every single finals game, bro. Just do, do yourself a favor, bro. Take a night. Just tap into one of the games. They got they on like Amazon Prime now too. I think they're on Ion. Um, it don't matter what what team is playing, bro. Is Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese, Cameron Brink, whoever. If it's one of the teams that don't got none of those high profile rookies, bro. It's real hoops going on. Physical hoops going on. Hey, if you're, if you're a narrative guy, they got a lot of drama and that shit. They too. got narrative, <laughs> bro. They got shorties dating each other. Defend, <laughs> right. defending defending the opponent because that's her girlfriend from her teammate. I like, seen bro, that, I'm bro. like, yo, y'all are wilding. Like, what? This is like, nah, I ain't gonna say nothing. But damn, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it is. It, it's like they they almost got more cinema moments right now than the NBA got going on. Like that is that is something that you would never see happen in the NBA. What? She got blocked. Teammate went to get up in her face. She said, chill, chill. Nah, that's girl, shorty. That's no, chill. shorty, you're not doing that. I was like, yo, bro, what are we <laughs> doing? <is> wild. <laughs> this is crazy. Something yeah. out of a movie. Right. All that to say, bro, y'all, if you're not locked into the W, at least a little bit, bro, do yourself a favor and, and tap in. At least watch, like, you could watch, like, because like, I'm not even acting like I'm sitting here fully watching games or nothing crazy, but, like, you know what I'm saying? You can tap in some highlight. Follow mm-hmm. some people on Twitter. Like you could tap at least know what's going on. Right. It's, it's interesting to know Be what's aware. Going on. Be right. aware. Um, but yeah, with that though, anything else you want to talk about? You want to wrap this up? Uh nah, man. I'm cool. I'm I'm excited. Game tomorrow, right? Yeah, tomorrow night. I think it starts at eight o'clock Eastern. I, I gotta go somewhere. I got work tomorrow. After I leave work, I gotta go somewhere. But I'm telling them, look, tch, y'all got till 745 and I'm gone. I'm, it's like I'm some birthday something. I'm gone. I'm telling you right now. I don't care. I'm out. I, so. I texted you on Thursday when I woke up and I was like, wow, the finals really start tonight. I really felt 
like a kid on Christmas. It was like, bro, my whole day was just revolved around. I need to have everything in my life done and wrapped up by like seven o'clock. I need to be watching the pre-show. Like I'm I was watching. Yes, yeah, fact. I'm I, was watching I, can't, I can't turn it on on tip off. I don't even want to turn it on with a national anthem going on. I want to be locked in. Not that I even need the pre-show, because to be honest, bro, the ESPN. Horrible. Matter of fact, I'm glad that this even came up. This is the last thing that we'll talk about before we get off out of here. Mm. We might be losing inside the NBA. Yeah, that's sad, bro, because like that's like elite TV. That's elite sports. That's elite television. Forget it's like it's sports. Right. It's not it's not replicable. It's not ES, no, ESPN has tried for years to put a group together to get <laughs> Mix even and remotely close to the type of energy that inside the NBA puts out. It's, it's not gonna happen, bro. It literally is just a perfect combination of personalities. Mm-hmm. Like you don't, you don't. It's like certain things are not replicable. Certain things you cannot put people like there's no like oh he's gonna be Shaq he's gonna be Charles he's gonna be Ken like this it does not work bro you right. just yeah I found a formula that's like perfect nothing you can't do it twice bro you can't right. it, it does not happen it's not even this the formula it's the fact that that formula works and there's not even anybody like who else is like Charles Barkley it's You're right. nobody there's, yeah, bro there's who nobody like Shaq. like Shaq right nobody that is true you don't really – there's no one out there like Ernie, bro. No, nah, Like the not. type – the way that he really be trying to keep everything going on track, if it's like just be chaos going on from the sides, the little times where he'll play into the jokes, like all of that is perfect. You just can't replicate all that. Even the dynamic when they're playing off of Kenny and Kenny's to the board, you know what I mean? Like it just – you cannot – get anything like that so the fact that next year potentially could be the last year of inside the nba bro that that really hurts i can't imagine going through an nba season without inside the nba i don't even think there's like i'm trying to even think of nba players who i'd be like oh, i can't wait till you become on like tv like, i don't even there's not maybe it's because like these guys are still playing you don't really see their full full personalities because i like, think you guys are retired no i'll take that back actually because like shaq was bugging when he was in the league so <laughs> so it's like i don't can't even think of nobody because people try to be like oh draymond is gonna fit right in it's like unless he's hating on rudy gobert like draymond he's gonna give good basketball talk i think he's a good like he obviously knows ball but like mm. chemistry wise and personality wise like i just there's no, I don't think there's nobody that could just replace these guys, which is it's sad. Right. That's childhood too. That's man, right, bro? They've been doing this for because who the last one to join full time was Shaq. It was Shaq, yeah. Um, I know before that they had like Chris Weber was up there for a bit. Mm-hmm. Like once they found that core four, bro, it they've never looked back. Um, mm-hmm. I saw reports. I think the the major NBA media deal is official, which is. Um, ESPN, Amazon Prime, it's ridiculous that we, everything gets split up into all these different streaming services, bro. Uh, but the biggest, the new and big player is NBC, which is making their return. I don't think they've done NBA in a long time, not since the nineties. Mm-hmm. Um, and so obviously now NBC is coming back. Turner got left out of that full equation. I saw a report that said that they potentially still could find a way to get in on some regular season games and potentially some playoff games. It's not going to be to the level that it had been in the past where it was like, you know, that TNT is doing like two days a week, sometimes more during the regular season where it's like, this is a TNT night. They have the national Mm -hmm. broadcast. It's going to be way more less than that. Um, And Ernie's been with Turner TNT, you know, his whole career, they said that he's not going to any other network. So that what you can't even even if you were able to find a way, which I don't think is possible, to sign Shaq and Kenny and Chuck. If Ernie's not on the show, it's not the same. He's a part of that one of the dude is there, right. it's not the same. Right. When Ian, I think Lefko is great. He's just he's not Ernie, bro. He's not Ernie. Uh, so even if, if if one of the other networks was able to find a way to get all three of them without EJ, it just doesn't. It's not the same show, bro. So I hope they can figure out a way. At this point, if if the two options are no inside the NBA and some 
I'm taking some. So if they can find a way to at least get a couple so we can keep inside the NBA, I'm all for it. But if they can't. The EJ. Vito, He's sad of the night. Right. Like, presented by nobody. <laughs> nobody. Like, bro, you just can't. <laughs> they can't take that away from us, bro. So I'm. If you are any of the execs at Turner at TNT, bro, I need y'all to understand what y'all, the product that y'all have put out, what you are potentially pulling from basketball fans everywhere, bro. Find a way to make it happen because inside the NBA can't just cease to exist, bro. I refuse. Facts. But it's life, man. What can you do, unfortunately? Yeah, because every every other, like, network's – pre-game, halftime show. It's just so – so. I saw trash. people going crazy on what happened, like, during the ESPN halftime. And it just oh, was what? like – it just it just was – it's dry. It's like a two-minute segment of Stephen A talking, and they go to commercial break. Then they come back. They did, like, 20 seconds on Josh Hart talking about the Celtics, and he went to commercial. And it came back. Michael Wilbon said something, and then at halftime was over. It's – I don't watch it. I, I that's why I asked, I don't watch the ESPN one. Like when TNT's right. on, I will keep it up there. I'll watch it, but halftime ESPN it's muted, and I don't. <laughs> I literally you know, like don't watch it All because right. like, I don't want to see Stephen A. yelling about nonsense. He just yelling just to yell, talking about right. whatever. Like, it's no uh, blend there. Like none. individually, I think Stephen A. is entertaining. I'm not looking at him for no great analysis because mm-hmm. look, the TNT show. We're being honest, bro. The analysis. It really it ain't, ain't like, crazy either. It ain't tip top, but it's they're right. entertaining. Like Stephen right. A, it's just that's why I said, it's just Stephen A yelling real quick. Right, <laughs> like that's now, it. Mal- Malik is being a host. I think Bob Myers is actually a really good basketball mind, but it, it don't it don't end fit, well though. with Stephen A. He's, Michael Wilbon just I don't I don't understand how he fit into this equation at all. He's yeah. one of the most decorated sports journalists ever. Like. It just this it's no this honestly this current one feels like one of the worst lineups that they've rolled out <laughs> over no this chemistry. entire tenure, bro. There's no chemistry whatsoever, like none. It's it's I, uh, it's terrible. I would rather see their NBA Today lineup with Richard Jefferson and Perk and uh, Chanel Gwimuke and right. Malika. Like I think they have good chemistry and are funny mm-hmm. and play off each other. And I think Chene and RJ offer a really good like insightful analysis again not looking to perk for that but perk man perky bro like (laughs) he is so worse bro he is the like if i'm telling you right you know what's funny there's probably people out there that really like yo bro i need real nba analysis bro let me listen to kendrick perkins (laughs) like let me listen to see what kendrick perkins gotta say he played in the league what do you mean like he say the most outlandish stuff in the world it's the craziest thing ever but yeah he's but he'd be having the moments where he was – we had one he was barking. He had the one where he, he was talking about what Luca was doing to the Clippers and stood up, took off his belt and started oh, yeah. the chair. Like, <laughs> he, he provides that that comic relief, and him and RJ always be going at each other. Like, mm-hmm. funny, there's a formula there. It's working. Just just put them on the halftime show, bro. Like, no disrespect. Like I said, Stephen A is the probably the most iconic sports media figure Ever, yeah, but Michael Wilbon, like I said, is one of the most decorated sports journalists ever. Bob Myers, a four time, you know, NBA champion GM. It's not, it's not hitting, bro. It's just nope. not hitting. That's a good way to end it. Bring back inside the NBA. Do not let next year be their last year, please, bro. Fact. Sincerely, all NBA fans. With that, though, that is going to do it for episode 60 of the Off the Glass podcast. As always, if you made it through the whole episode, we appreciate you. Be sure to subscribe to the channel, like the video, comment your thoughts down below on how you're feeling about the final so far, what you think about the adjustments that we're going to see going into game two. Follow us on the socials at Off the Glass Pod on Instagram and at Off the Glass Podcast on TikTok. And we out. Peace.